Well, I figured first I should tell you about the big wooden pulpit in the room, right? Yeah. Um, this was listed on the Sierra Pacific Synod newsletter, which Sally emailed out to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, as did you see that there was a link towards things that were free from other congregations? Well, this was one of the things listed as things for free. Can you do it? Oh, wow. So this, this was the, the pulpit that they used at St. Mark's Lutheran in Pleasant Hill. Um, and I think Lyle Beckman, who is the San Francisco Night Minister, said he thinks he's the only person who's ever preached on it in the last 10 years. Oh. Um, they had it already. It's on wheels. So if we don't like it, can move into the other room, or when we do our Advent um, yeah. evening service, Perfect. we can take it to Brotherhood Hall and use it in there. Um, before I saw how heavy it was, and Pam and I lifted it up the stairs over here, I imagined maybe blessing animals outside with it, but it's too heavy, and I'm not taking it yeah. down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so um, the only cost that we had in getting this new piece of furniture was just the hundred dollars it cost to get a U-Haul truck and to move it down here, so, well, and for the gas to Pleasant Hill and that. <laughs> it's worth it. I have probably paid $300 to get here. Uh, so, there you go. Yeah, it's a beautiful little hand carved. We got it because I was the first one there, so, so that's Smart. Good. Um, and the other, the, one of the particular reasons that I got it, on the front is a, a verse from Matthew chapter 24. You all knew that, right? Uh, go out to the whole create the whole world, proclaim the good news to all creation. Um, and so, um, in October, we're going to have four Sundays of the season of creation. Mm -hmm. It's something that is um, a new a new way of doing liturgy in different parts of the year that some congregations choose to do, particularly in these long stretches where it's where it's ordinary time for a really long time. Um, and so it will give us an opportunity to, to worship and care about different parts of our creation. Um, so even if you want to dream about it, there's a forest Sunday. I think there's a volcano Sunday, right? So different parts of, of creation get their own Sunday. Uh, and, and Dorothy is accepting prayers for finding special music for forest Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our, our little pulpit if we like it it can be here if we don't it doesn't have to be um, for now a baptismal sign is back here a little bit hidden just because the wood color clashes a little bit who cares <laughs> um, so as we as we begin our worship service and we remember our baptisms um, we'll experiment with where we want the baptismal font to be um, but for this Sunday it's here for the folk who like to get their fingers a little wet right before communion um, so it's so it's here, but you, if you are sitting in a spot where you can't see me pour the water, you just have to listen to it and, and imagine it, okay? <laughs> oh, here, we'll do it like this. So let's remember our baptism. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the holy communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also no, with you. Let us sing. Let us sing. <laughs>
<laughs> we feel unfinished.
we shall see what will become of his kings. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to their father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty, there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels. They were carrying guns, gum and balm and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to these Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. And so when Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Word of hope. Word of life. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.
14th chapter. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat was battered by the waves and was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came, walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come on to the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When he got to the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. You may be seated. Surely the Holy Spirit is in this place, right? Yes, sure is. <laughs> Woo! It's a good thing, too, uh, because the text we have for this week are some doozies. If you are someone who has experienced a lot of chaos or is in the midst of a difficult time, these texts might stir things up a little bit. Anyone in here have a perfect family and get along with all of them? Yeah. You do? Good. Except we've got one couple with a perfect family where everyone gets along. The rest of us, hopefully, hopefully our experiences aren't as difficult as Joseph's family. Could you tell what was happening in the scripture reading, even though the, mic, the miking was a little bit of an issue? It's the story where Joseph's brothers decide they don't like Joseph so much that they're going to sell him into slavery. Well, if I had a dollar for every time that's happened to me. <laughs> Whew, thank goodness, right? Even though some of us have difficult families or difficult family members, don't look at any if they're here. <laughs> Probably none of us have had family members as difficult as this story in Joseph's text, right? None of us have been sold into slavery yet? Okay. Not yet. <laughs> I like to think of this text as one of the worst things that could happen. There are other texts that talk about difficulties in families with abuse and the trauma with addiction issues and drinking, but this text is one where your family not only abandons you, but they get rid of you in a way that gets rid of your freedom, gets rid of your birthright, gets rid of your connection to land and to faith. It's probably about the worst thing you could do to someone. <laughs> My um, connection to this, to this text is that it was the, the later on verses about what happens later um, was used in the service where, um, the, remember, the Lutheran church said gay and lesbian people couldn't be pastors. And then 20 years later, they're like, oh, no, we think they can. And they had to have a service of reconciliation to allow the pastors who had been serving to come into the church. And for our scripture reading for that text, we tried to think about what would you want someone to say to you when they have cast you off, they've said that there's no place for you in worship, they've kicked you out of the family, and what kind of reconciliation would be honest? As pastors, it would be easy to pick any of the forgiveness texts, right? The ones where you love your neighbor even though they're a jerk. The texts about understanding justice or where it talks about God bringing a new heaven and a new earth to the world, right? If you think of any time in your life where 
where rules maybe have changed. I bet, I bet many of you sitting here have seen a bunch of rules that were really strict to get a little bit looser. From who was allowed to have communion to if you could wear blue jeans and come to church, right? To any of those rules that your, your mom or your dad might have had about what you better do if you're going to eat your dinner. And so we've all had experiences of, of rules changing. But the text that comes after this, much later after this, remember Joseph becomes a fancy person because of these dreams where he's able to predict the future, he's able to become useful to the political leaders of his time. He predicts a famine that's coming and creates a scheme to save wheat. To save wheat so that during the time when everyone's going to be hungry, they will have saved up enough food that it won't be a hardship for people. And so later, when Joseph is in charge of this food line and everyone from the surrounding regions has to come to get their daily bread, to get their wheat rations, Joseph is in charge. And then here come these brothers who sold him into slavery. And at first they just assume they're not going to get any wheat. And their brother is going to treat them with the same discomfort and the same rejection that they treated him with. Do you remember what happens, how they reconcile with each other? They weep on each other. No one says they're sorry because they're not there yet, right? No one says, oh, don't worry about it. Remember that time you sold me into slavery? Don't worry about it. Because Joseph's probably still pissed off, right? Even though he's made something good about it, oh, out of it, he still is probably pretty angry. Any of you had something where someone treated you badly and even though you made the best out of it and you might even be stronger for it, you're still mad that someone put you in that position in the first place? They just weep on each other. And so we read this text as we were being reconciled in the church because we were still pretty mad and the church hadn't said sorry yet. And we thought that this was a reconciliation where at least you can cry in the same room. You might have different pains. You might have different reasons that you're upset. We haven't figured out how to forgive yet, but at least we can cry in the same room. And so this story of Joseph and his family never actually gets resolved. We don't have a moment where someone was big enough to say, I'm sorry. Whatever Joseph did that made his family so mad to sell him into slavery, he doesn't seem to apologize for. Whatever the brothers did, Right? They don't apologize. They just keep going. It's not very helpful if what we're looking for is a do-it-yourself guide to fixing your family problems. Right? Although a lot of people have written fancy books that say that they can come up with this step-by-step -step guide to make your family work perfectly, this Bible story isn't it. It would have been helpful because if we could have learned about how you can still be a family and love each other after someone sells the other person into slavery, don't you think we could fix pretty much everything else? But that's not the text that we have. Also, in, this, in our text with the, the rolling seas, I like the Mark version a little bit better than this Matthew text. The Matthew text makes it sound like Jesus knows what he's up to and he's going to show the disciples a lesson and teach them something about their faith. It sounds kind of like he's planned it, right? It, it makes me imagine when I read this text in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus has sent the disciples out with the purpose of just meeting them later by walking across the sea and getting back in the boat. In Mark's version, it says that Jesus has sent them out with the purpose of going to the other side and that he will meet them on the other side of the lake. And it says, Jesus is walking across the water as if to pass them by. And they have to call out to Jesus and get his attention and let him know that there's a storm and that they're afraid. So imagine Jesus is just out on a jog or on a walk across the, the lake. He's going to meet them at the next destination, and they're calling him and saying, please save us. 
So it's less about Jesus showing off and being like, hey, look at me, I can walk on water. And more about maybe some alone time for Jesus. He doesn't want to be on that boat for just a little while. But it's out of the fear that they call Jesus a slave to Moses. You can think about this in a literal way. You can imagine how amazing and miraculous it would be if you could walk across water. It's supposed to remind you of what Moses did when they walked through the sea to get away from the Egyptians. In fact, most of Matthew's text is about making you think that what Jesus is up to is doing everything Moses did but better. So that would be a good thing to imagine. Think of of leading people away from slavery and to freedom by walking across the water. You could think of it, if you wanted to, as kind of the advanced version. You remember the story where they're all in the boat and a storm comes and Jesus is sleeping and then they get afraid. They wake up Jesus. He doesn't take them seriously, but he makes the storm go away. Do you remember that one? You might not have rephrased it the way that I did, but, right? So they're all in the boat and they're afraid. So this is the second version of that story. It's the take it a step farther, right? If you think about it, it's, it's, if that first story where they're sleeping in the boat and there's a storm, if that story is what to do to calm down chaos in the world and how to be with God in the midst of that time while you ride out the storm, then today's text of Jesus walking on water is another option. It's when there is chaos in your life, you walk away from it. Right? You don't need to sit in it and wait for it to die down. You just walk away. It reminds me a little bit of, have you heard the joke about the person who's in the midst of a flood and they climb to the roof and they pray for God to help, right? And a boat comes along and they say, I don't need a boat, God's going to help me. <laughs> and the flood keeps rising and then a helicopter comes and they say, I don't need a helicopter, God's going to save me. And they end up drowning and God says, what do you mean? I sent you a boat and I sent you a helicopter. <laughs> right? You've heard that one? This reminds me of that joke, right? God wants to provide us with little alternatives that help us walk out of that chaos. And maybe it's a friend who lets us vent even when we're wrong but we feel better. Maybe it's someone who comes to visit in the midst of the hospital. Maybe it's a, 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 a person who can go back and fix our sound system and help us figure it out. Right? For me this week it was a, a big bag of clothing, hand-me-downs from a teenage boy who didn't want to wear them but fit me. Right? So we have these little moments where someone might offer us a hand in the midst of the chaos and try to help us out. But this story, too, I think is a lot like our lives. Have you ever tried to be that person who helped someone out of a difficult time and they reached out their hand and they start to make progress and then they sink right back into it? It reminds me a little bit of what's up with women who are in abusive relationships. Sometimes you reach out your hand and you pull them out and the storm and the love and what is good and what is bad is all chaos together and sometimes even though they grab your hand, it doesn't get better and they're not able to leave at that time or maybe ever. I wonder if this story is less about proving that Jesus is a magical God or a miraculous God and more about waking up and opening our eyes towards those opportunities that come to us. Whether it is another person in the world, whether it is a sense of peace that comes over you in a difficult time and you have no idea why. But this idea of being lifted out of the chaos being able to walk above deep storms, for me, feels comforting. I like to think about it being God coming to help us get out of our situation. It could also be that other version, right? If you've ever had someone in your life who wasn't willing to even take your hand or to consider getting out of their chaos, 
and you need to be the one who stands behind them and gives them a little bit of a shove. I wonder, as I think about Peter walking on the water, if he really was that scared, how hard it would have been for him to get out of the boat and climb into the sea. It reminds me, have you ever, have you ever tried to do something really high up in the air or seen someone on TV try to like go on a zip line or jump with a bungee jump? There's that moment where they sit on the edge and become terrified. No matter how brave they were, maybe at the top of a really big water slide, there's that moment where you just don't want to go And sometimes, even if it's just a slide on a playground, you've got a mom's hand on the back of the child that gives them a little shove for the first time. And it's terrifying until they realize they liked it. So I wonder, as I think about this story, what the other disciples were doing, wouldn't it be interesting if they gave him a little shove off of the boat? (laughs) Peter's certainly the kind of guy who would have needed it. But I wonder what those other disciples were up to. And sometimes we're the ones who need the shove in the back to head in the direction that God is calling us or to head towards a life out of the chaos that's bugging us. Sometimes we're the ones trying to give a little bit of a shove. The difficulty, again, is that this text doesn't come with a how-to manual. It doesn't say when do you give someone a little push to go towards God or to go towards the things that are going to be good for them. It doesn't say, when do you jump into the water and try to walk out of the chaos? It doesn't say that God is asking you to do something because you will notice these four things will happen, right? Wouldn't it be great? A big blue light will flash and then you'll have tingles. Like if there was a a for sure way to know that the thing the hard thing that you're up to is for sure what God wants you to do, wouldn't that be easier sometimes? So it's not left, again, with a how-to manual, and so we're left, like our worship service today, right, to be people who just try it out. Right? Like Peter. He doesn't get it the first time. He tries it out. And God gives him a hand and pulls him back out of the water before it gets too serious. I wonder if he tried practicing later by himself. Maybe in a kiddie pool somewhere? (laughs) All right, I'm going to get this. Maybe that was the hardest thing about the resurrection, is that Peter wouldn't have essentially the little toddler floats anymore for trying to walk through chaos. It's hard to know. But this text, and the text about Joseph, gives us permission to try. And maybe one of us in this room is going to be the one pushing somebody along. And maybe someone else in the room is the one holding the hand out. And maybe a completely other person is going to be someone coaxing someone out of their chaos. It takes all of us in the different ways that we're community with each other, right? So I want to give you the good news this Sunday. The good news that you can get it wrong. That you can drown into the ocean of chaos sometimes. But always be looking for handouts. That God will push us farther than we can or are willing to go. And yet... I will be longing, and this congregation will be longing, and God will be longing for us all to be on the other side of whatever that swirling storm is in our life. And so we keep praying every Sunday for peace, even though when you hear the news, it doesn't sound like it's possible to get it. And we keep praying every Sunday that illness and pain will end, even though we're all getting older and we're discovering new aches and pains every day. And we keep walking into the storm, helping others out, and living, and screwing it up sometimes. So as we move along, my advice is not a how-to, how to get out of trouble, or how to get into trouble, but permission 
to assume that people trying to help have good intentions. Right? To assume that we're doing our best. Because right? sometimes we offer unsolicited advice and people don't think we're up to something good. To err on the side of talking through problems with the assumption that it actually could calm the storm. I know, you can look skeptical at me, I don't care. We're talking about what God has as something that's possible, not something that we've figured out how to make possible. And so let us keep paying attention to the storms, to the jerky brothers, or to wherever these conflicts and hiccups come from, Say no to them happening more, and yes, to walking on water and helping somebody else. Amen. Amen. Every time. Yeah.
mother Jeannie and for Lexi. God in your mercy. Prayer of thanks back Kitty's home. And a prayer for the man this morning who may have passed away. God in your mercy. Our prayers rise like incense and are held by a God who yearns for us to be our best. May we sleep well, worry less, and live convinced that God is on our side. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Amen.
We remember that dark night when Jesus gathered with his friends with that sense that chaos and difficulty was just on the other side of the next corner. And still, they gathered with joy and celebrated a final meal. And when Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks and blessed it, gave it to all to eat, to eat, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks, blessed it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, this is my blood shed for you for the entire forgiveness of all of your sins, so that every time you eat of this bread or drink of this cup, you can do so remembering We ask the Holy Spirit to be in this bread and in this wine, that it may transform our lives, that it may help God flow through our veins, and that it may inspire us to heal the world, to heal ourselves, and to be God for all that we need. We also ask the Holy Spirit to be in you, completely and fully and pushing you And together, we proclaim those words of faith that are new to some of us, but gather our faith and our breathing as we say, Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Chain Bearer, Light Giver, Source of all that is and that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, Loving God in human heaven, the hallowing of your name.
that was pretty good. Thank you, Laurel, for making it so good. She even made more than one batch because it didn't work the first time. That's how much she loves you all. Um, just a couple of announcements. Um, one is that um, if you haven't heard about this project before, um, remember I took away all the hymnals? And have you noticed in the pew they leave a little ugly square from where the um, sun had been protected on the pew? So um, I was inspired um, partly by Earl, Earl's love of the devotional books that come, um, to fill that space um, with another book that would be brightly colored for our sanctuary. I, maybe it's proof that I'm an overachieving pastor that I thought we should cover it up by writing another book. Um, but also, if you, if you wonder what I was up to while I was off and sick and wasn't allowed to stand up very often after my surgery, this was the first tangible result of that. Um, and um, there will be three books like this that end up coming out. Each one takes four months of the year and writes a devotional for that day based on something that happened in history on that day in the past. So it might be something um, like a war or something that happened that's memorable. It might be the birthday of like Angelina Jolie, something like that might be in here. Um, or it could be like um, celebration of Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech. Um, so it's, it's really diverse. And um, in about two weeks, this was the proof copy where I got to fix all the, the last minute typos. Uh, so probably in a week or two weeks, we'll have about 50 of these coming and they'll line up the pews. The hope is that each week, um, if you want to take one, you can take one. You can, um, we'll have a little form that if you want to put a little extra in the offering to take one, you can. Or if you just want to take it, you can. Um, that's how it works around here. Um, and the hope is that you might share them with other people that you know as a way of saying, hey, check out my church, right? Because there's a whole section in here about how, gr how great our congregation is. Um, or that you would use it in your own personal life. Starting on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, at noon, we're going to have a brown bag Bible study where you can bring your lunch and we'll read through one of these for our first Tuesday, and you can kind of see what they're like. So if you're free on Tuesday at noon, bring a brown bag, or if you forget, we'll probably be able to scrounge some stuff up. Um, the way that we were able to um, pay for the printing of the first books that will go in the pews is we did a t-shirt um, sale fundraiser. Laurel and Mary Lou, will you guys stand up? So we have two people who are wearing theirs today. <laughs> We've also had um, some generous members of the congregation who have made it possible for us to get extra. So if you ordered yours online, I have them available. And if you didn't order one, you can have one anyway. Because, again, we've had um, contributions in, in that exceeded what we needed. And anyone who bought a t-shirt will also get a free book is the idea. Sound good? So the books are coming and the t-shirts are here now. I'll put them up and then um, as we head out on our way to coffee hour, we're, you're welcome to get a size that you want. We have small, medium, large, extra large, and maybe 2X as well. So make sure you stop by before you leave. They'll also be here um, next Sunday and, and a couple weeks after if you think you don't want one today, but then go home and realize you do want one. Sound good? <laughs> All right. T-shirts and books. Council meeting? Yes, there's a council meeting on Tuesday, 7 o'clock. Is that right? 7 o'clock, Tuesday, council meeting. 7 o'clock? Council meeting at 7 o'clock. We're good? Okay, let's sing. 